order. And do I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Representative Lesh moves the minutes. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Minutes are approved. Um, the first bill we have on today's agenda is, for consideration is House File 80. Uh, Representative Hillstrom, would you like to move your bill? Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair and members. I move that House File 80 be recommended to pass and be sent to the Commerce Committee. Um, Representative Hillstrom moves House File 80 be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Commerce. Uh, Representative Hillstrom, please present your bill to the committee. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Members, I just want to start by saying this bill will be coming back to us. Um, it got referred to us first. It will be going to Commerce and then Civil Law, and then we will be getting the bill back. Uh, members, this bill is uh, related to people who buy debt um, and then do collections and result in a default judgment. Um, members, I have um, the Attorney General's office with me. Um, we've been working on this proposal together, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over and you can introduce yourself. Thank you, Representative Hillstrom, and thank you for having me, Madam Chair and members. My name is Nathan Brenneman. I'm a Deputy Attorney General in the Minnesota Attorney General's office, and as a part of my uh, duties, I oversee uh, the work that we have done in the debt buyer area. Um, and in that work, we've seen, uh, frankly, problem with uh, debt buyers. Uh, especially, uh, we've seen the problem that when debt buyers, uh, these companies that uh, purchase old debts, uh, come into court and use the courts to obtain judgments against Minnesotans, uh, often with uh, incomplete or inaccurate information. And that's what this bill is designed to address. Um, debt buying. Uh, is the business of uh, purchasing and selling and purchasing uh, old debt, sometimes very old debt. Uh, debt buyers purchase debt for pennies on the dollar and then uh, turn around and use aggressive collection tactics uh, to collect on that debt. Now, <clears throat> when they purchase debt, debt buyers uh, get very limited information about the debt. Typically, these debts are bundled into portfolios of thousands and thousands of debts, and there's just certain limited information that follows these debts as they get bought and sold, and that's the information that they receive. When debt buyers turn around and approach courts to obtain judgments against debtors uh, with this information, it creates a, a problem for them because they don't have the information they need to, to prove debts. And so what this uh, and that creates a, n a number of problems, and I'll, I'll give you a couple examples of those problems. Uh, in uh, the course of our uh, casework, we uh, heard from a woman named Kaiyua Yang, who's a Minnesotan who appears, is here in Ramsey County. Uh, she's a bank teller. Uh, she was saving money. Uh, she's uh, set to be married uh, to a young man, and they're trying to, to save money. And the first she ever heard of a debt was when her bank account got seized, uh, and it, it was when she determined, when she looked into it, uh, she had she found that a judgment had been entered against her. It was the first time she'd ever heard of it; never got served with papers or anything else, and that uh, there was she was now being garnished, and her bank account of nine thousand dollars had been seized. Well, it wasn't her debt. And when she approached the uh, debt buyer to resolve the situation, she provided a, a, a number of pieces of information that confirmed that what it was in her debt. They simply weren't responsive. They wouldn't back off. Uh, they asked her for, they tried to negotiate with her, asked her for three quarters of the amount, half of the amount. Well, it, it required her to then go get an attorney who, who showed the, the debt buyer the same information and again, really got no results until they had to fight this thing all the way to court. And of course, it wasn't her debt. They ended up getting the judgment vacated, but it cost her $2,000 in attorney's fees. And so this is the problem that some Minnesotans find themselves in in this scenario, is that these debt buyers acting on incomplete information go after the wrong people. And, uh, <clears throat> and people are left with the choice. What do I do with this debt? What do I do with this problem, this judgment that's been entered against me? I need to get an attorney. It requires them to spend money on an attorney or, or try to negotiate uh, this debt that isn't even their problem. Uh, another example, we had uh, Daniel Fisher, who we also met in the course of our work. He first time he ever heard of a debt was um, 
when the credit card company contacted him and said, we're reducing your credit limit on your credit card. And the reason why is that there's been some bad credit reporting due to a judgment that's been entered against you on the debt. Well, for that Daniel Fisher, it turns out they just had the wrong Daniel Fisher, we found out in the course of our case uh, against Midland Credit Management and Midland Funding. And uh, he uh, ended up getting the, the problem resolved. But again, it took a lot of time and effort on his part. And, and a default judgment had been entered against him based on this incomplete and uh, inaccurate information. And so that's really what this bill is about. It's about basic fairness. It's about uh, these debt buyers, when they come into court, uh, they can't just cast a wide net uh, based on this limited information that they have and sweep up people uh, who they're collecting against who either don't owe the debts. Or we have seen some instances also where uh, it may be someone who owes the debt, but uh, the amount is wrong. Uh, that they paid off part of the debt, that they, or they at one time owed a debt, but they went back to the original creditor and paid the debt, but the step buyer had a record of it, and they don't have a record of the payment, and so they're still trying to collect against this person who, who paid the debt. Now, this bill, uh, it just requires debt buyers to come forward when they move for a default judgment uh, with some just basic information that seems fairly commonsensical. They need to come forward with admissible evidence uh, uh, of proof of the debtor, that they have the right person, proof of the amount of the debt, that the debt is valid, and proof of ownership, that they own the debt and they have standing to bring the suit. Uh, and so <clears throat> it is an issue, uh, I think, of, of making the court system uh, work better. This bill will give courts the information they need to make good decisions on these uh, debts and make the, uh, the right decisions. And um, you know, it's really uh, putting more of a burden on the debt buyers to come forward uh, with accurate information, with complete information uh, on these debts that they're trying to get against Minnesota. So thank you again. Um, thank you, Mr. Brenneman. It looks like we have a question from Representative Lesh. Thank you. Uh, actually, it's, it's for the author. Uh, Representative Hillstrom, do we have testifiers in opposition to this? We know of? Madam Chair and uh, Representative Lesh, I believe that there will be um, some folks that will be talking about some concerns that they have. I've been meeting with folks that have some concerns about language. Um, I did receive some proposed language from other folks. Of course, it didn't meet the 24-hour rule. We've got a lot of stops that it will go and it will ultimately end up here. So I believe that there will be folks that will be talking about some issues that they have that they're hoping could get resolved. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and uh, Representative Hillstrom, will they be testifying today? I believe they will be. Okay, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I, I wouldn't want us to be in a position of entering a default judgment against the opposition. The irony would just be too much. So, um, um, Madam Chair and, and members, I'd also like to uh, tell you another story that um, I heard about. Um, during the time that uh, I met some folks who uh, came to talk about their stories, um, there was a woman who had signed, a co-signed on a credit card for her daughter. And she was a Marine, and um, her daughter defaulted. So then her, when she found out about it, she paid the debt of her daughters. And years later, then had a default judgment against her for the debt that she had previously paid. So members, um, we're going to be working um, to make certain that uh, before people get these default judgments, they're actually entitled to get the money that they are attempting to collect. And that's the purpose of the bill. And with that, I'll stand for questions. Um, thank you. And Representative Scott? Yeah, just a quick question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Will this affect just the people that buy these huge amounts of debt? Will this affect someone that's a private citizen that maybe they're moving out of state and they really can't stay in the state to collect the debt and they give it to a collection agency? It, it, so to collect, I mean, is, is it going to affect them as well? Mr. Brenneman. Thank you, Madam Chair, Representative Scott. Uh, that's a good question. This, debt, this uh, bill only affects debt buyers, and so uh, companies that uh, purchase a debt. I think the scenario that you're talking about is an instance of a, a debt collector, and there's a distinction there. Typically, if a creditor uh, wants help collecting on a debt, they can contract with a debt collector who then provides a service to them of going out to collect the debt. That's different than what's targeted in this bill, which is debt buyers, buyers of debt that purchase typically large portfolios of thousands of debt 
debts for, for, like I said, pennies on the dollar, and then use efforts to, to collect those debts on their own behalf because they own the debt. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and Representative Johnson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <coughs> and Mr. Brenneman, do I understand it cor correctly then that currently the only thing that uh, is submitted is the application for judgment? Are, are these six items new? Um, Items that will be submitted to the court. Yep. Thank you, um, Madam Chair, Representative Johnson. Uh, these are new requirements. I mean, right now it's not required. Uh, it is required uh, under the rules that an application for default judgment be made and that um, you know, the party come forward uh, with what they need to prove default judgment. But in the past, that's typically only been that the other side does not show up and proof with that the other side does not show up. And so this provides uh, more substantive provisions about what evidence they need to come forward with to show that they're entitled to a default judgment against a Minnesota debtor. Very good. Thank you. And Representative Draskowski. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Mr. Brenneman and Representative Hillstrom. I've uh, question uh, the, the proof that they need to provide in terms of delivery of a summons or uh, the notice of the default judgment what uh, what form does that proof take and uh, how, how burdensome is that thank you madam chair representative uh, typically for the summons and complaint the form that that takes is an affidavit uh, of service that's uh, produced by the process server who served the lawsuit. So that should be a document that's readily available to the debt buyer that they can submit to the court showing that that's uh, been served. Uh, the notice of default judgment is typically mailed uh, to the consumer and so they would have a letter that will have gone out to, that would require a letter to go out and then they would have to file that letter with their, their paper. So I don't see that as being a, a onerous uh, uh, obligation uh, to put on on debt buyers. It's just the production of those two documents, one of which should already be happening in files, and the other of which is just a mail button. And Madam Chair, uh, Representative Hillstrom, uh, thank you. And some judges are currently requiring a large amount of these, just not everywhere. And so, um, and in some areas, one or two judges are doing it, and not everyone. And so, we'd like to have it be standardized. We'd like everyone to know this is what you have to produce in order to get a default judgment in Minnesota. Madam Chair. Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, what, um, what, what is kind of the, um, I mean, what would the, in, in practicality for this, um, uh, what would a, a threshold of this information have to be? I mean, for instance, uh, it talks about a chain of information, uh, you know, showing the assignment of debt, et cetera. If there's one of those missing, uh, what happens? Who makes a judgment as to whether, you know, the whether the collective uh, information included in this bill, um, at least the amount able to be provided by that particular uh, debt buyer, is is enough in, in a particular circumstance. Um, depending on how, you know which elements apply to them, or maybe they have partial, you know, um, demonstration of this, but not all of it. Madam, Madam Chair and Representative Droskowski, so the judge in a default judgment is the one who's always making the decision if there's enough, and they they do that now. And so what we are saying is that these are the minimum things that you have to provide, um, but the judge ultimately has um, the decision of whether or not to sign a default judgment. If a default judgment is not signed, it still can go to court. Um, it's just whether or not you get a default judgment without both parties being in court as well. Madam Chair. Representative Draskowski. Thank you. Uh, any idea what this what this additional cost that this would accrue to, to these debt buyers at all? or? Madam Chair and uh, Representative Droskowski, so we're not proposing another hearing. We're saying you have to have this to get the default judgment, so not every single one of these is gonna require a hearing. Um, and I don't know what the person who sells the debt is gonna charge them to actually buy a copy of the receipt showing the person actually owed the debt. But don't you think we should require them to show that the person really owed the debt before we let them get a default judgment? Madam Chair, I 
And I and Representative Hillstrom, I, yeah, I do think that's a good idea. I'm just kind of looking at how this would play out and uh, appreciate the discussion. And, Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, Representative Gruskowski, I think there are some debt buyers here that might want to um, talk about that. So, Are there any questions from members for Mr. Brenneman? Otherwise, we'll move on to the public testimony. Seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Brenneman. Thank you. And if there are others here to testify on House File 80, please come forward. Hi. Hi there. We're not together. <laughs> oh, well, whoever is going to go first, please state your name for the record and proceed. <laughs> Madam Chair, members of the committee, Ron Elwood with Legal Aid. I just want to say that I appreciate uh, Representative Hillstrom bringing this forward. Uh, we, uh, Legal Aid supports the bill. Uh, we would suggest we've had uh, clients and seen clients that uh, the same stories as uh, Mr. Brenneman related to you, um, and we simply think this appropriately restores um, what uh, should be the burden, the appropriate burden of proof on the plaintiff to prove up the case. I mean, that's just basically what this bill does. And I think it also better, really better delineates for the courts and for everybody else who actually does owe the debt and who does not legitimately owe the debt. So I think it's a, it's a really good bill, and uh, we hope you would support it. And happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there are questions from members for Mr. Elwood. Representative Lesh. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And um, I asked this question of uh, Representative Hillstrom. And uh, she seemed to indicate uh, an answer for him, but I just want to confirm it from you. Uh, when I uh, was last year, I came back from Ranger School at Fort Benning, and one of the soldiers with whom I went through called me up uh, two months later uh, and told me he had been shipped off to California, uh, and he had bought a car there and then had had another permanent change of station back to Kentucky. Uh, and uh, suddenly, uh, a month after that, his friend called him and said he saw his car going on a flatbed truck down the road away from the barracks. And uh, he was wondering, what the heck went on? Well, uh, apparently he bought the car from a friend who bought it uh, from someone else out of a judgment. Uh, and uh, no one, no one had, had sent the paper trail all the way through to establish the fact that he was a good faith purchaser. And in fact, the judgment was fully satisfied. Um, and so he was out of a car, and the car was two states, two or three states away at that point. Um, would this law apply to a situation like that, or is it only with respect to uh, money, liquid, liquidated uh, judgments? Mr. Elwood? Uh, Madam Chair and Representative Lesh, uh, you're probably asking the wrong person. Uh, we didn't bring the bill forward. Um, I think Mr. Brenneman would be better, actually, to answer that question as the proponent of the bill. If you don't mind. Okay. Mr. Well, Brenneman, just... do you want to come forward? She's still here. Representative Hillstrom. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Chair and Representative Lesh. I'll give you the same answer here that I gave you um, yeah, before. Yeah, but I want it from someone else, Representative. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, members, this really is about when someone else is buying the debt. So, for example, if someone had sold that car loan debt, and then the person who originally had that car loan then went and repossessed it, um, that would be different. But in this case, I don't think anyone sold off the debt. So this bill doesn't really apply unless it was a debt buyer who purchased the debt. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions from Mr. Elwood? Okay. Next testifier, please state your name for the record. Yeah. Uh, my name is William Hicks. Uh, and I thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I'm a, I'm a shareholder at uh, Meserly and Kramer Law Firm, and I'm the chair of the firm's uh, collection uh, division. I've been practicing in the uh, collection field for over 30 years, and I'm here uh, today as an officer of the Minnesota Creditors' Rights Association, and we're an association comprised of lawyers who represent creditors in collection litigation. Uh, I'm also an officer of uh, our National Trade Association, the National Association of Retail Collection Attorneys. Uh, and I, I do want to say, I mean, we are, we are sympathetic to the concerns that, that are raised by this bill and this bill in, intends to address. Uh, 
And, uh, I mean, we support a proposal for legislation regarding the requirements for obtaining default judgments in, uh, in these kinds of consumer collection cases involving assigned or, or purchased debt. Uh, and we understand the need for these requirements um, and to protect consumers. Uh, in fact, in 2011, our association helped draft legislation which is very similar to this legislation and which this legislation is essentially based on. Uh, that was sponsored by Senator Latz and Representative Smith. Uh, and uh, we sponsored that and it didn't uh, make it through because of lots of other uh, legislative activity that year. But that was our bill. We drafted it uh, very similar to this. So we, we support these ideas. Uh, we would like to be, continue to be involved in the process of helping to make this legislation work for the consumers uh, and the courts and our clients and believe we need to be involved given our expertise and experience in this, this area. And we certainly support the goals of making certain that the consumer named in a complaint is the consumer that uh, took out the debt and that the amounts that are in the request for default judgment are accurate uh, and that our clients own that debt. Those are all goals we have and, uh, and nothing good comes otherwise. Uh, our clients don't benefit. We as lawyers don't benefit, and certainly the consumers don't benefit. Uh, there's all kinds of issues that arise when it, it, it isn't the right person or the right balance, and lawsuits get commenced. And, and so uh, and we're aware of some of the abuses and, and errors that have, have occurred in cases in the past and want to help eliminate uh, those abuses. I mean, the concerns we have, and just, uh, just a couple more comments, the concerns we have with the language proposed, you know, centers on really the proper legal process to be followed to obtain default judgments. Uh, there's a big volume of these going through the courts every year uh, in the hundreds of, of thousands. And so it's got to be done right. This has to be crafted so the courts have the ability to handle these volumes of files. Uh, specifically, we want to make certain that the motion hearings uh, where we're going to involve a judge and the bench is only going to be only taking place when needed, uh, that evidence is accurate, uh, and not merely admissible, and that we have, uh, we and our clients have a bright line for the effective date of this statute so that the implementation of this statute doesn't impair existing contract rates, uh, contract rights that, uh, that debt buyers uh, currently have. Uh, so uh, uh, we also want to make sure that the courts have the necessary staffing levels to be able to handle these additional requirements. Uh, and um, so I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, we look forward to working with uh, the author as the bill moves through to the other committees. And I certainly welcome any questions anybody has. Are there questions from members for Mr. Hicks? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Hicks. Is there anyone else um, that wants to be heard on House File 80? Please come forward and state your name for the record. Uh, Madam Chair, Scott Larson, St. Clair Capital. I am uh, um, my company buys debt. Uh, essentially, in the language that's in this legislation, frankly, I agree with wholeheartedly. I think that anytime you purchase a debt, whether you are the original assignee from the original creditor or subsequent down the line, I think that it is incumbent upon that purchaser to be able to provide and prove that the individual to which they are attempting to collect that debt or file in court that they are the correct person. But I think what you have asked uh, 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 previous uh, testifiers is does this apply to that vehicle that was picked up? Well, any time a debt is assigned, it essentially this law covers it. Mm -hmm. So. I think the origination of the problem needs to be solved, and that problem is the documentation to which the original creditor makes available to the debt buyer. And there has to be a dictated and delineated fee for that information. So if these are the six items that you require, which are fine, then that needs to be embodied in the legislation that this will be made available by that debt seller, that original creditor. And subsequent down the line, that documentation is available. At a fee, which is fine, but let's define what the fee is. Now in some cases it's $5 or $15 for the contract, but let's also remember 
that much of the consumer credit card debt that is purchased is done over the phone. And what triggers that contract is their first purchase. So as you now define, we now have to have a statement. Well, let's assume that in this economy for 15 years, an individual was fine and that individual paid their credit card on time. And all of a sudden they lost their job, wife lost their job, husband lost their job, and they're in a critical problem and they don't pay. Well now, you're not going to be able to go all the way back from its origination to see each and every charge they had. So stating that a statement, a current statement at the time of default, that bears the account number together with the contract that establishes some identifying number such as Social Security number, which should be valid, and this is the identifiable person, that now should be enough documentation. Then from that standpoint, that contract and any uh, um, uh, changes to that contract that we as consumers, when we receive from a credit card company, they can change their terms. You can refuse those terms if you so choose and stop using the card, or you can accept them and continue to use them. So that information needs to be made available. And then from that standpoint, you now compute from that contract what late fees, interest, whatever the case may be from that standpoint. Now it's up to that presiding judge to be able to determine in that layout, is this number correct? And you have to then prove it from those numbers. But I think it's incumbent upon the committee to attempt to amend the legislation that now requires the documentation from the creditor. Because if you purchase it without this, and this law goes forward, what now happens is you're not going to have a lot of debt buyers that want to buy it. So the reason that these creditors, in many cases the large banks, are selling the debt is because of the reserve requirements required by the Fed. So it's easier for them to sell it at 10 cents on the dollar and balance, bring their balances into, uh, into shape rather than having to increase their reserves. That's why this is being sold. But the volume of what's being sold is really a rounding error. It's not a lot in comparison to the asset. So this really is a situation where if they now can lump this together on a spreadsheet, send it to the debt buyer at seven cents on the dollar, uh, and don't have to do anything else, they've now alleviated that from their balance sheet. And as a consequence now, you're out here as a debt buyer with no documents. Geez, I need a contract. I need an application. I need the statement. Well, they may be available. Well, in this bill, it should be required to be available. Then at that point, you've accomplished your problem. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Larson. Are there questions from members for Mr. Larson? Not seeing any questions. Thank you, Mr. Larson. Thank you very much. I'm not aware of any amendments to House File 80. Is there any further discussion? <clears throat> Representative Hillstrom. Uh, thank you, um, members. I just wanted to make a couple of comments based on some of the testimony that happened. Uh, members, I'm not attempting to interfere with the debt buyer and the seller and their contract terms. But I want members to know that currently contract terms, um, there are some contract terms that are um, very concerning to people like me. For example, one contract that I have here, it says the buyer acknowledges and agrees that the loan may be unenforceable loan and may have a little or no value and that the seller shall have no obligation to repurchase any loan sold here. Another section says the accuracy or completeness of any information provided by the seller to the buyer including without limitation the accuracy of any sum shown in the current balance or crude interest amounts due under the loan. Basically saying they are not making any representation that it's accurate. So that's in the contracts that people have that sign when they're buying this debt. And I think that if they're going to get judgments against the citizens of Minnesota, they should have to prove that that person actually is the debtor, that they owed the debt, and the person who's trying to collect it has a right to actually collect that money. And so I would ask that you send this bill on to the next committee, and we'll continue to talk about it throughout the process before the bill comes back to us. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to ask uh, Representative Hilstrom if she's willing to work with some of the folks that have testified to, to address some of their concerns. 
Representative Hillstrom. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Chair and Representative Scott. I am happy to continue to talk with them. They have submitted some language to me. I received it today. I will review it. Um, just because I agree to work with folks doesn't mean that I'm going to give them exactly what they want. But yes, I will continue to talk with them about uh, what they think their needs are. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, seeing none, Representative Hillstrom renews her motion that House File 80 be recommended to pass and re referred to the Committee on Commerce. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? The motion prevails. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> The next bill we have for consideration is House File 19. Representative Fortman, would you like to move your bill? I would, and I feel a little bit rusty. Um, it was amended in the last committee, but I don't have to move it as amended, right? I'm just moving House File 19 because that's what it looks like now. So, Madam Chair, yes, I'd like to move House File 19. Uh, Representative Fortman moves House File 19. Um, Representative Fortman, please present your bill. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, members. Um, this is a very simple bill to solve a problem that um, people are encountering um, more often with elderly relatives, but also with other relatives that need help with their checking accounts. What the bill would do would allow for a situation where somebody could uh, be assigned to help their parent with their checking account, but not become a, a joint tenant on the account with you know, ending up uh, owning that account upon their parents death. This is a problem when the other siblings um, would like to share equally in uh, mom and dad's assets. And to, to better explain the bill and what it does, I have um, Drew Basie from Briggs and Morgan. Uh, Mr. Basie, please state your name for the record and proceed. Madam Chair, uh, my name is Andrew Basie. I'm a shareholder with Briggs and Morgan. Uh, I am the chair of the Minnesota State Bar Probate and Trust Section Legislative uh, Committee. Um, with regard to this bill, I think it was summed up. Uh, it's a way for uh, most likely scenarios for an elderly parent that requires some assistance with bill payment, uh, deposit of Social Security checks, uh, cash withdrawals, provides a way that they can name a child or neighbor or uh, whoever it would be, trusted individual, uh, designate them as an agent on that account. What it gives the agent the authority to do is uh, negotiate checks, go make withdrawals, go make deposits for this individual. Uh, what it does not do is give them an ownership, the agent an ownership interest in the account. Um, it does not give them any right to the account as far as upon death the principal. Uh, upon death the agency ends. Um, it's a balance, it's a compromise between uh, the other option for the elderly individual that needs help would be to give a uh, power of attorney. Uh, which oftentimes can be overly broad, uh, gives a lot more power to the agent with regard to you know real estate, insurance, retirement, gifting, uh, may not be appropriate, may, may not be what the individual intends. Um, so short of giving a, a full-blown statutory uh, power of attorney, uh, this is another tool in the tool belt for an individual to, to get some help with bill payment and uh, limit the rights of what they're giving to the individual. Um, thank you, Mr. Basie. Are there questions from members for either the author or Mr. Basie? No, nope. seeing none. I'm not aware of any amendments to House File 19. Um, Representative Hortman renews her motion that House File 19 be recommended to pass. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed. The motion prevails. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, just to be clear, that motion was to send it to the General Register. Um, that's correct, Representative Portman. Up, uh, members. Next on the agenda is House File 87, and I think we're just going to. Um, Representative Hortman is going to present House File 87. I'm sure Representative Winkler is on his way. <laughs> or maybe we have a page looking for Representative Winkler. Um, House File 87 is Representative Winkler's bill. 
and um, I know he has a testifier here. Is that correct? And um, I don't know what the bill does, but uh, Madam Chair, I will move that House File 87 be recommended to pass and referred to the General Register. Uh, Representative Hortman moves House File 87. Um, Representative Hortman, are you going to present the bill or do you want to go straight to the testifier? Uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to introduce um, Brian Lake from the Minnesota State Bar Association to uh, describe the bill. Thank you, Mr. Lake. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Brian Lake with the State Bar Association. Um, this is uh, a bill from our real property section of the bar. Um, it does many incredibly exciting things. Um, <laughs> I'll just run through them very quickly. Um, the, the main part of the bill is that really in section one is the, you know, the really only substantive change here. Um, the problem is uh, when people are using transfer on death deeds or any kind of deed that is designed to transfer ownership in a property upon the death of the owner, um, the, there's a struggle to, <laughs> to make sure that the property tax statements are sent to the proper address. A deed needs to have a single address to which the property tax statements are sent and usually the current owner wants it sent to them um, wants to be transferred, um, that's, that's the, when the ownership is transferred, um, they need a way to easily transfer the, uh, where the property tax statement should be sent. So what we're suggesting here is that an affidavit of survivorship could be used to change the address to which the property tax statement is sent um, to carry out the wishes of the party and make sure that the property taxes are, are paid and kept current. Um, this is kind of a problem at the county recording level. This is something that um, um, all the people involved in this lawyers, uh, their clients, and the county recorders um, like to get fixed. So that's what we're proposing there in section one. Um, section two uh, is related to the partial release of mortgages. So in situations where, uh, say, a developer is working on multiple properties, they might have you know, 15 lots in a subdivision. Um, they want to sell off, uh, you know, say, one of those lots or two or three of those lots. This allows for the partial release of a mortgage. Um, there's a standard practice that is kind of built up around that uh, now, and we're simply codifying that. Um, the last parts of the bill um, really make incredibly minor changes. Um, sections three and five uh, just address a couple um, places in the statutes uh, where we're simply doing nothing more than dividing a paragraph into two paragraphs to provide for greater, greater clarity. Um, and sections four and six just address some outdated uh, acronyms that are used. Um, when you think of common interest communities, uh, like a condo association, um, they're now called common interest communities, used to be called common element communities. Um, there were a couple spots in the statutes that still had outdated acronyms, acronyms um, that said uh, common element community certificate of title or the abbreviation CEC, CT, and we're simply updating that to the uh, currently used terminology, which is CICCT. So, uh, that is what the bill does. It's pretty uh, simple, very technical, and, and there's no opposition that we're aware of. Uh, but I'd be happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you, Mr. Lake and um, Representative Winkler. Welcome. Is there anything you'd like to add on um, House File 87? Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to um, reassure the committee that these are not the things that lawyers spend all their day thinking about. <laughs> Just Brian Lake. <laughs> are there questions from members for either Mr. Lake or Representative Winkler? Seeing none, uh, I'm not aware of any amendments to House File 87. Uh, Representative Hortman renews her motion that House File 87 be recommended to pass. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? The motion prevails. Thank you, Madam Chair. How many of these do you have lined up today? <laughs> uh, members, we're adjourned. Next meeting is Wednesday at 2.15.